Hi, I'm Brooklyn. Thanks for tuning in to Faith Community Online. If you haven't already, take a moment to click the red subscribe button so you're the first one to know the next time we post a video or podcast that will help you connect, grow, and lead right where you're at. And if you'd like to know more about getting connected at Faith Community, stick around at the end for all the ways to do that. We hope you're encouraged to take your next step as you move from where you are to where God wants you to be. Today we kick off uh, our series in Esther, in which we're going to be spending the next, uh, I just say so many weeks, because I don't know how many, uh, so many weeks journeying through this uh, story, uh, 10 chapters uh, over the life of Esther, the little bit that we get to know about her, but the amazing contribution that she made uh, to God's people and ultimately uh, to us today. So what I want to do is, I just want to jump right in, but I want to give some background information uh, regarding the book. One of the things I would encourage you to do is when you jump into reading a book of the Bible is, uh, there are so many resources out there, you can uh, get some background and context to kind of root you in. What was going on at that time in history? Where is this taking place? Who are the, you know, the main characters? What are the main points kind of things that you should be looking at? It's just going to inform uh, your reading. So I want to first start off of where it takes takes place in the Bible because the Old Testament, it's in the Old Testament, is not organized chronologically. Uh, that's why you'll be reading one thing and then this will happen over here and you think, why isn't this in chronological order? We haven't grouped uh, our English Bibles uh, in chronological order. We've grouped them by subject, you know, law, poetry, history, prophets, that kind of a thing. That's why the groupings take place. So Esther is actually uh, out of order where it's placed, right after Nehemiah. So you have Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. They all take place right around the same time, but here's just a little fun fact. Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book, and we split them into two, the story of Ezra and the story of Nehemiah, but they were written as one complete unit. Now, Ezra uh, had happened about 30 years prior to Esther. Ezra is really important because he leads the group back to rebuild the temple uh, in Jerusalem. The Israelites have been taken captive by the Babylonians or the Persian Empire. And they, have, they've been, they left Israel, went all the way into Iran. And there was a particular king, the Persian king, that granted them the opportunity and helped fund them going back to Jerusalem. So Ezra leads that charge. Now, not all of the Israelites went back. Matter of fact, the majority of them stayed in Iran. Nehemiah takes place about 40-ish years after Esther. So we have Esther squeezed right in the middle. So it may have been more appropriate to say Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, but that's not how we did it. So I think 30 years from Ezra and 40 years prior to Nehemiah. This is Esther. And what it is, it's the story of God preserving his people. Uh, Otherwise, there would have been no Nehemiah to write about, no wall to rebuild. So that's where it takes place biblically. Now, historically, let's look at its place in history. We're in about 480-ish, or right around there, uh, BC, so pre-Christ. Now, let's take a look at this. This is during the Persian uh, Empire. Look at this. The Persian Empire was huge. It was the largest known empire in the world up until that point. For whatever reason, we don't study the Persian Empire very much in school. Uh, we know a lot about the Roman Empire, the Egyptians. It's just kind of, we kind of just gloss over the Persian Empire. The opening sentence of Esther says that it reigned from India to Ethiopia, comprising 127 different provinces. I mean, look at this. That is massive, Persian Empire. Let me read to you. Here's what one, one commentator said. It says, it covered modern day, the Persian Empire, modern day Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, and parts of e- Egypt, Sudan, and Libya. That's how big this was. There were millions of people speaking a multitude of languages, and they all owed allegiance to their sovereign lord, the king. Listen to how the Persian kings were referred to. He was known as the great king, the king of kings. You ever heard that statement before? The king of kings and the lord of lords. It's not like that was a brand new title that was given. A lot of times what you see throughout the scripture is titles that were taken and the writers are using it subversively to push back against the culture and to say, no, the only authority, the all-powerful authority lies in God himself who is sovereign. So that's why Jesus being the king of kings flew right in the face of their history and also right in the face of Caesar because they would say Caesar is Lord and the writers of the New Testament were saying, no, Jesus is Lord. So a very subversive way to do that. Just again, food for thought. 
Now, so you have this story taking place in the Persian Empire. The king at this time for Persia was a guy named Xerxes, or the Hebrew rendition of that is Ahasuerus. Now, Xerxes is how we, the Greeks rendered it. His father, and for some of you people who are familiar with the Bible, was King Darius the first. And you'll remember King Darius from a famous story, Daniel in the lion's den. So Darius appears in Ezra. Uh, let me, I, I thought I memorized it, but I didn't. Ezra, Daniel, and Haggai. You'll hear of King Darius. So King Darius is Xerxes' father. And then in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is dealing with King Artaxerxes, who followed Xerxes. So we have a historical rooting. Why talk about this? Because it's so important for us to understand that these were actual people who lived in an actual point in time in history. These things happen. They're not fantasies. They're not stories that were just written trying to mimic or emulate something. These were actual people in actual time. So let's take a look at some of the uh, pictures here of the, of the Persian Empire. So this takes place in Susa, uh, this story, which is in southwestern uh, Iran, modern day. I think they call it Persepolis. So this was Susa, the, cap, the kingdom right there, that capital. Go to the next one here. This is maybe, maybe what it looked like at the time, the fortification of Susa. Now, this right here is just really cool. Like late 18th, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, archaeologists discovered the palace of Xerxes. That's where our story takes place. Our story opens up with a drunken party right in the palace of Xerxes. That's how the book of Esther opens up. And you could actually go and stand uh, maybe approximately where Esther would have stood uh, in this same palace if you're able to go to Iran. So go to the next one. Here, as you see, this, uh, this is a rendering image of Babylon. I think AI put this together, we didn't. Uh, what could have Babylon looked like? I think the next one is like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. I don't know, it looks like Pandora from Avatar to me. But uh, the other thing, I think there's a, isn't there a picture or a relief of Xerxes on a wall? I don't know if we have that one in there or not. I put it in my, in my notes, maybe not. Nope, okay, Brett says we don't have it. Anyway, you can go type in King Xerxes and you'll see it online. It's a relief on a wall of, of, of what Xerxes may have looked like. So Xerxes was a real king and this took place in, a, in real time and in history so long ago. It was interesting as I was looking at the, the map and everything, I noticed that uh, where it was in Iran and my father and I, when we went to Africa, we had to fly through Doha, Qatar and uh, we say Qatar, but they said Qatar every time we were there. And I was looking on the map and I was like, holy cow, we were so close. Just right across the, the sea there was Iran where we, where we were at. And uh, you know, I have a rule when I, when I fly. I can only say I've been to a country if I get off the plane and put my feet on the tarmac. If I'm just in the airport, I don't count it. Sorry if that flies against your rule. You know, so I can actually say I was in the Middle East because I stepped on the tarmac and it was 100 degrees at night. Um, but we were, we were right, right there, so close yet so far away. So this is where our story is rooted in this period of time. The Persian Empire, the, the Israelites are in captivity by taken through Babylon, by the Babylonians that eventually became part of the Persian Empire. Now I want to just kind of set the stage for us a little bit of some things to be thinking about uh, regarding the book of Esther before we jump into chapter one today. Now, one commentator said this is some things that we can learn about Esther, to be, to be aware of. The book of Esther, not the person herself. But no book in the Bible speaks more clearly to us of the gracious, sovereign protection of God towards his people, yet his name is never mentioned. The book of Esther actually has been debated throughout history of whether or not it should be even part of what we call the canon, the Bible, because of the lack of mentioning of God's name. It doesn't even reference him. It only gives a scant allusion to him. His name is not there. Matter of fact, the early church fathers, none of them even wrote about the book of Esther, not a commentary or anything. But it did become very, very important to the Jewish people. Throughout his book, this book, excuse me, the invisible God can only be seen by his footprints in history. And I love this. The hand that shields his people can only be perceived by faith. The hand that shields his people can only be perceived by faith. And lastly, he says, this guy's Colin Jones, says that no book has more to teach us about prayer. We learn so much about the method and manner of true intercession. We see a clear foreshadowing of Christ's high priestly office, yet no prayer is recorded or reported in this book at all. Fascinating. You'll never see God's name. You'll never hear anyone pray. You'll never hear anyone call out to him, yet he works in a beautiful way. He can only be perceived by faith. 
I hope that we can find some, uh, something in common with Esther and God's people in this book. Now, we, we, we're not going to face the same situations. Uh, we're not going to be in the same set of circumstances. But we're all going to encounter, have already encountered, what it's like to serve an unseen God. When all we can do is perceive him by faith. Because it seems like he's not present in a way that we can discern through our perceptions, our human perceptions. But he's always there by faith. So what I want to do before we jump in right away to the first chapter is I want to go to the key verse uh, in Esther. It is the most quoted verse in the entire book. The phrase, so maybe some of you have it on your walls, for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Here's what it says. This is Mordecai, Esther's uh, cousin. Some say uncle, some say cousin. But Esther was an orphan. Her parents died at some point and Mordecai adopted her and raised her as his own. Esther is in the, in the palace at this point, and we're going to work up to this point. And she's having a conversation with Mordecai, but not face to face. It's through a messenger back and forth, back and forth, of the severity of what is happening. Because what, is, what has taken place in the story at this point is a man named Haman has gotten the king to sign a royal edict that basically is going to ethnically cleanse the Jews from the Persian Empire. And Mordecai tells Esther this, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. What I want to focus in on is the perhaps, because that's the humanity there. I'm actually glad that Mordecai doesn't say, Esther, there's no doubt in my mind that you have been called for such a time as this. This is the only allusion to God right here. He says, who knows if perhaps, but he reminds her of something. What you need to understand, Esther, is that God will send deliverance. God is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God, and deliverance will come. He will save his people, but you cannot escape the reality of this moment. You will, if you don't do anything, you're gonna die. And if you do something, I can't guarantee you that you won't die. But who knows if perhaps everything in your life, every situation you've been through, your parents passing away, this moment that you find yourself in right now, who knows if it's for such a moment as right now. And you know what? You and I never know. We can never fully be on the shadow of a doubt. No, all we can do is be faithful and be obedient. Because here's the thing. Mordecai does not tell Esther that she's special. He does not ask her to be important. He just asks her to be faithful and obedient with the opportunity that's in front of her. Now, we live in a culture that loves to tell us how important and special we are, don't we? And you're gonna walk out today and say, well, all I learned is I'm not special or important. (laughs) No, you are. I don't need to say it anymore, okay? You are. You have inherent value and worth because God created you. But the purpose and goal of life is not to try to be important or special. We know that we are because God created us and because of what he sent his son to do. And I would argue that we should endeavor to be faithful and obedient. It's Esther's faithfulness and her obedience and her courage that make people think she's special. But she wasn't trying to be special or trying to be important. We read about her today and it is important what she did, but only because she was faithful and she was obedient. And that's what I want to challenge us with over the course of next how many weeks, to just be faithful and obedient. And when you come in the auditorium, you'll see there's, there's four new signs on the wall. You're like, we have signs? Yeah, we do. And it really focuses in on this perhaps. It's the things for you to consider for your own life. Perhaps that God is working in the chaos. Perhaps your struggle has a purpose. Perhaps you're right where God wants you to be. And perhaps God keeps his promises. And then I added a fifth one. You could say, perhaps I didn't want you to say any of that, Josh. I just wanted you to fix it. (laughs) Fix it all. Now, now we jump into chapter one. Chapter one opens up in in an amazing way with a drunken party. There's one thing about the Bible that you'll discover if if you sit down to really read it and think about it. God never spares describing humanity. God never whitewashes over humanity, does he? He always exposes us and then shows us how much he loves us and that his grace comes in the chaos. And this opens up with a chaotic scene. So let's jump in. 
These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At the time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. Remember, southwest Iran. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of these provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days. A tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. A 180-day party. Now, it says that all of the military officials and nobles and princes from all over the empire were there. Question is, who's ruling in their absence? That's what I want to know. But these dudes are going to have an opulent party, six-month festival. Why? Here's what King Xerxes, we know historically what he was doing. His father had planned to invade Greece. Now, he is going to take a doomed excursion to try to invade Greece. Now, in Athens at this time in history, they're celebrating their 79th Olympic Games. And Xerxes wants to prove to the people that his empire has all the wealth and the power and the the dominance to be able to do it. So he takes and throws on a six-month-long party to prove to people we can take the Greeks. Little did he know there'd be a guy named Alexander the Great. And the Persian Empire would cease to be so great. Because he would not win in Greece. But he is arrogant. He is is indulgent. He He is impetuous. He's all the things, and this party proves it. So they have a 180-day party. And when it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the people from the greatest to the least who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days in the courtyard in the palace garden. So they party for 180, all the you know, uh, rich aristocracy. And then they say, all you other people that are here, let's come have a seven-day party. So 187 days of craziness. It says the courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains and blue hangings, which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to silver rings embedded in marble pillars. Gold and silver couches stood on a mosaic pavement of, I don't know, marble, mother of pearl. How do you say that? Oh, thank you. Porphyry. Learned a new word. Still don't know what it means. And other costly stones. Drinks were served in gold goblets of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. By edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking, for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. So you can only imagine what's going to happen. So they've already been doing this for 180 days. I was thinking to myself, I go on a seven-day cruise on Carnival, and I come back, you know, 10 pounds heavier. I can't imagine a 180-day party. Then seven days of just drunken stupor. That's what they're doing. All, why is he doing this? All because he wants people to see him as the king of kings. Maybe just maybe the writer of Esther is helping us to understand that this is the king of kings in light of the father, God almighty. So at the same time, it says Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. So they had a men's party and they had a women's party. I love this next sentence. On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was high in spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him, high in spirits. I don't know, maybe the translators could have just told us he was drunk. But he was high in spirits. He gave them who attended him and all these seven guys. He said, bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman woman. But when they came, they conveyed the king's order to Vashti. She refused to come. And this made the king furious and he burned with anger. The reason why she refused to come that many believe is because there's every indication in the text that he wanted her to come and stand on display naked before all the men. Not just fully clothed in a robe. He wanted her to be an object of just people gawking and staring so that he could demonstrate further his wealth and everything that he had. And she refused to do that. That's the refusal here. And that digs even deeper to the heart of this king that this is his wife, but he'll use her just like he'll use his treasury. Doesn't matter to him. She's just another resource. So he's furious and he burns with anger. It gets more comical. He immediately consulted with his wise advisors who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked their advice. The names of these men were Karshena, Shathar, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, I'm horrible, Marcina, and Mamukin. Now, one of them is going to become pretty important. Seven nobles. These guys were nobles of Persia and Media. Media. They met with the king regularly and held high positions in the empire. So he gathers his posse around because he's angry and he wants, he wants revenge. And he says, what must be done to Queen Vashti? 
What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders? Properly sent through his eunuchs. And Mamukin answered the king and his nobles, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Listen to what he says. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn what Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. The women are getting out of control, king. We gotta put a stop to this. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did and start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. So if it pleased the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. Here's eight drunk dudes in a room. <laughs> trying to, think, and they're like, yeah, this is a great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, want, we don't want our wives to be out of control. The kings and his nobles thought this made good sense. So we follow Mamukin's counsel. He sent letters to all parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and say whatever he pleases. <laughs> Scene, chapter one. That's it. Think about that. The question remains, what in the world do you preach after that? This is the scene that unfolds. This is the, the empire. This is what Esther is going to navigate. This king who is arrogant, probably, you know, immature, has resources at his fingers that no other person in history has ever had. It's the largest empire that's ever been. From India to Ethiopia, he can, the party is estimated to be in the millions of dollars that were spent. Now, Queen Vashti, who are you? You do what I say. This is the man to whom Esther is going to be married. To who knows if perhaps. Because they're putting, on a, putting a royal edict in place for all 127 provinces just to tell the men, don't let the women get out of control. <laughs> Think about that. And God is going to use a woman to save his people. Wow. You ever think about that? I just love that piece. You're trying to hush the women, put them in their place, and God's going to raise a woman up to be courageous, to be faithful, and to win the heart of the king, and God is going to save his people. If you're asking me how I would do it, I probably would have not let it all go on. But this is how God chooses to work. So I guess two things, not three, just two, to think about as we dive into this story over the next so many weeks. What can we discern from this? You know, there's not much you can discern from chapter one than don't be at a party with King Xerxes. That's probably, you know, what you learn. But what we begin to see is this is the, this is the you know, the context for which God is gonna work behind the scenes. To me, it's chaotic. To me, it's not something that I wanna be a part of. Because out of this is going to arise a man named Haman. Because the king and his lust for power is going to allow a man named Haman to put in a royal edict to start ethnically cleansing the Jews from the Persian Empire. Because they're a threat. And God is going to work in just the most amazing ways that you could never think possible. And what we begin to see from this is that God's purpose prevails. God's purpose prevails. All the time. God is a covenant keeping God. The, the book of Ezra opens up with a reminder and the reality of this that God gave a prophecy through Jeremiah. And what he said is, is that because you haven't been listening and you've been disobedient, because God made a covenant with his people, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't do this, you'll be, you won't be blessed. God was very clear from the beginning. They were not doing the things that they said they would do. <clears throat> God said, you will be taken into captivity. But I will, I will use this to rebuild and I will punish the Persian empire. And he does. And it's a reminder of that. God's a covenant keeping God. 
If God makes a promise, he will do what he said he would do. And someone said it like this, one of the commentators said, Esther tells of our sovereign God at work, even when most of the characters involved are unaware of his presence. There are so many times in our own lives where God is at work and we are, we are part of the story and we don't even know he's there. We don't even know that he's working. And it's not until we look back that we can see the hand of God perceived by faith. Wow, now I can see that God is a covenant keeping God. I mean, this scene is chaotic and you're thinking, how in the world is this gonna, gonna work? How, how, I mean, to open a story of the Bible like that, just sets the scene for God's gonna have to do something pretty amazing. And I often read, you know, the Bible, I don't mean like to tell you that I often read the Bible, but, because I only read it to preach, but you know, I'm just saying, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. <laughs> and, I, and I read the stories as they unfold, and I think to myself, God, why do you allow all this? Anybody else? Why do you allow? Because if it were me, I mean, just stop the party. And just say, hey, uh, there's a guy here named Haman. The Lord told me uh, we're going to kill him. And we don't have to deal with any of this mess. Now, that's just Josh. But aren't you glad I'm not the ruler of the world? And Lauren says yes. <laughs> and I, 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 I have asked why so much. And I don't think why is a wrong question. But I can tell you this. I've never gotten any great conclusions from why. Or maybe I should say it like this. I've never resolved the tension of why. What I have learned is to ask why while keep moving forward. That's all we can do. God, I don't know why, but I just gotta keep following you. Because I don't lead you, you lead me. You're the cloud by day in the Old Testament, fire by night, and I'll ask you why as I move forward. Can I encourage you today that maybe whatever you're going through, whatever situation you find yourself in, you don't know how you got there, you don't know why you're there, and we could debate all of those circumstances except for the fact that you're there. And I don't know why God allowed it. I can't, I can't speak to that. But all I know is that he's present and he's there. Right. And that we could maybe at times only perceive him by faith. And my encouragement is keep moving forward. Just keep following. Because when you stop and you start to let why dominate you, you can become bitter and all those things. It's often, in my short experience on the earth, it's often when we, we move through it that we look back and then we have understanding. Oh, now I understand a little bit more why. And you can all, you, you know, I've asked people, would you, knowing what you know now, if you could go back, would you do it different? And there always are aspects of things that you would do different, but there's always something that seems to emerge from the conversations is, if I have to give up what I know and what I've learned, I don't think I would forego that experience. Now that may not resonate with you, but it does resonate with me. That yeah, there's some things that we would do different, but we can definitely tell our kids and maybe people that we're mentoring, don't do that. Don't, I'll tell you what I learned and just take it from me. Don't go live that. But we begin to understand why. We see the footprints in the sand that God was there. We just don't always discern it in the moment. David Guzik, he said this, he said, God was behind the scenes orchestrating these events to set the stage for his ultimate purpose to save his people. God was orchestrating the events. Now that's a, off, a, an equal, it's equally hard to, to understand and, and, and somewhat easy to accept that yes, God, you do work in all things, but the difficulty is you do allow them. And again, we'll just set that aside and let it be what it is. But his promise will prevail. I, I promise you that. Because this covenant that God has goes all the way back to Abraham. When God said, through you, Abraham, all nations will be blessed. And God made a covenant with Abraham and God swore by himself. He didn't make it with Abraham. Meaning that God said, the contingency of this covenant is me keeping this covenant, Abraham, not you. It's me. And God will do what he said he would do. And he would not allow his nation, his people, to be destroyed. Here we are, however many hundreds of whatever years in the future in this moment in Esther, and we think to ourselves, how is God going to make true on his promise and keep his covenant? That's what unfolds over these 10 chapters, that God is faithful. And either he is who he says he is, or he isn't. And so his promise will prevail. 
Secondly, is this, is that God brings order out of chaos. He brings order out of chaos. As I said, this scene (laughs) that we read is chaotic, right? It ends, it's a 187 day party that ends with eight guys in a room making a royal decree that men can say whatever they want, to put it in very simple terms, all because the king was offended at Vashti, refusing to come out and be naked in front of people. The power, think about that, the power to do that. You're like, man, this is, this is a crazy ruler. But God, and it's chaos there. How's God gonna bring order out of this? And I couldn't help but think, I said, well, we gotta go all the way back to the beginning of the, of the scriptures. Let's go back to Genesis. Here's what it says in Genesis 1.1. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So we believe that, that the universe has a beginning and God created it. And what is described is that at the beginning of of the universe being created, gravity was not a law, right? We didn't have all of these things holding, you know, things together. It was a formless, empty void, a vast expanse of nothing that God began to create. There's chaos. Listen to the definition of formless. One of them, if you look it up, using the scripture, is a place of chaos. Void means empty. Now, chaos means complete disorder and confusion. Was God creating chaos? No. God was creating a universe that is so finely tuned that it functions, right? That our, our earth that we live on this planet is tilted at the very right you know, degree of its axis. Otherwise, life would not be possible. It was the process of the, the creation, but there was chaos in the beginning that God was bringing order to. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I think that there are times in our lives, and maybe you're in one now, where you, are, you find yourself in a chaotic situation that is just empty, seemingly, of order or meaning or understanding. And you may not know how you got there. Maybe it's choices that you made. Maybe, maybe somebody else made choices that put you there. Or is anybody a victim of someone else's crazy? You, you didn't know they were crazy, but then you, you married crazy, and now it's crazy. Or just things in life, just crazy and chaotic. And you find out yourself in the midst of chaos, which is confusion and a complete disregard for order. And you don't know up from down, left from right. And the beauty of this is that God can bring, brings order out of chaos. He, he's not the author of confusion, but he's seemingly very comfortable in the midst of chaos. Sometimes we think that we're the ones that have to bring order to our lives so that then we can approach God and say, look at all this that I have together. And God's like, you got nothing together. I will bring order out of the chaos. And if you go to the, to the beginning of, of the gospel of John, it starts in a very similar way to Genesis, in the beginning. John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning the word already existed, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Saying that in the beginning, in this darkness, this void, this place of chaos that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were present. And when they said, let there be, order emerged. Substance emerged that was good and that was whole and that was functional for the good of the creation and the created order that would come after that. So God is present in the darkness and the chaos, and when he speaks through his son, Jesus Christ, order emerges. Well, what do you mean? Is it possible that when we invite God into the chaos of our lives, that he not only can enter the chaos, but he brings out of the chaos substance that is good and is in order for you and I? That we don't know how he's going to do it, But if we believe that his promise will prevail, and that as as Colin Jones said, that the graciousness of God is on display in this book, that even though we got ourselves in this situation, or someone got us, let's just say sin got us in this situation, whether knowingly or unknowingly, God in his grace will enter into the chaos and bring us out because he's the only one that can. 
Now we could debate the circumstances of your chaos, but maybe on a more practical level, the reason that maybe you're in relational chaos is because you're not doing things God's way or your parents didn't do things God's way. If you don't do things God's way, there will be disorder. There's no blessing. I'm not here to, excuse me, put blame on you. I'm just saying, God's way is blessed and in orderly and good. The other ways of doing things are not. And the only way for order to come is to begin to do things his way. Now, I understand there are some relational situations here that are beyond your ability to control and you're making decisions in partnership with someone else. I'm not talking about the extenuating circumstances, but I'm just saying if there's disorder, what does God's word say? And then do that and over time, order and goodness will emerge. Wholeness will emerge. Financial disorder. If you have financial disorder, that's rarely someone else's fault besides your own. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be funny or rude. It's just true. What decisions have you made? Have they led to order or disorder? What does God has to say about it? Quite a bit. What if we do things God's way? You name, you name the situation that you have chaos in your life and let's see what God has to say and how God works and let's not see if order will emerge over time. The problem is, is it doesn't happen immediately. That's the problem. I want an immediate fix. Well, what we'll learn in the book of Esther, it wasn't immediate. And it got worse before it got better. But faithfulness and obedience, God, in his timing, which I don't always like, brings his purpose to prevail. And he brings order out of the chaos. Chapter one ends with tension, doesn't it? Kind of funny as we look at it. But the tension of these eight guys in a room in high spirits making decisions on behalf of the entire kingdom. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at our own nation and I think those people are in high spirits. (laughs) And I wonder, regardless of the party, so hear me, And I wonder, God, what are you going to do? And I just think, what a perfect time for us to step back and realize that there's one thing that we know for sure is that God is a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. And what what did he make a covenant with? Not the United States of America. His church. Hear me, people. His church. God's church has prevailed for 2,000 years. Nation states and countries and empires have risen and have fallen in 2,000 years, but God's church, his bride, has prevailed. That's a hard amen sometimes, isn't it? His church, he will provide, and he has provided. And for 2,000 years, the church has not only prevailed, but has been strong. And my point in all of that is, if God can deal with someone like Xerxes, then what, come what may in November, God is still on the throne. And he brings order out of chaos. And he brings goodness out of all of it. So, may we just endeavor to move forward. Ask all the whys you want but just trust in the faithfulness and the goodness of God who is sovereign. Matthew Henry said it like this, and I'll shut up. Providence, God's sovereignty, wisely overrules the smallest and the greatest affairs in the world and serves its own purposes by them. Overrules. Whatever happens, God is sovereign, and he will turn into the good all things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He takes all things and turns them into good for those who are willing to be faithful and obedient. I don't know about you, but rather than look at everything going on and cast doubt and criticism, I'd much rather exercise faith. And I want to perceive the hand that shields me by faith and not proceed forth with fear 
and doom and criticism. But just sit back and say, God, can't wait to see what you're going to do. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. And before I continue, if you're a member of the prayer team, I'd love for you to, at this point, you can step up on the side and just want to encourage any of you, if you need prayer at any point from now forward, please, we'd love to pray with you, especially if you find yourself in a place of chaos and and craziness. Father, we thank you for the peace that passes and transcends understanding and guards our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I just want each of you, whether you're here or online, just to take a moment, take a deep breath, and just rest in the knowledge that God never leaves nor forsakes. He never abandons. He's the ever-present help in time of need. Just take a few moments and ask him to speak. Father, we can't even begin to know the future. We can guess, prognosticate, offer opinions. But what we can do is trust in you who have proven yourself faithful over and over and over again and ultimately in the person of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Lord, I pray that peace, the Prince of Peace, would dominate our hearts and minds. An expectancy would rise up within us of you providing for your people and your church. Lord, I just pray if there be anybody here or watching online that has yet to follow you, or maybe you want to recommit to following Jesus, today is an invitation for you to do that. And that, if that's you, I just want to encourage you to, to pray something like this. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. And my life is chaotic because of sin, and I recognize that. And I give that all to you and receive from your son life, forgiveness, and wholeness. And I'll choose to follow him for the rest of my life as he becomes the Lord and leader. Father, for the rest of us, may may we, we too just recommit to following you and knowing again, as I said, that you're present and you're here and you're moving and you're working and that we're excited to see how you're going to do it. May we proceed with peace and may we know, Lord, that, that you are ultimately in control over everything. So would you bless us and would you keep us? Would you make your face to shine upon us? Would you show us your favor and give us your peace? And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Thanks for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you. So here are a few ways you can do that. If you're new here, or you made the decision to follow Jesus today, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000. One of our team members will follow up soon with details about how you can take your next step at Faith Community. We also believe that God cares about the needs going on in your life. So no matter where you're joining from, we would love to pray for you. Email prayer at faithcommunity.co with your prayer request. You can always learn more about the church at faithcommunity.co and stay connected on social media. Shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram to say hello. And finally, click the red subscribe button and the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. Thanks again for joining us online today. We'll see you next time.